every successful person got there by going through tough times. Success is a hard-ass teacher who likes to knock you around along that journey. You know, it takes real guts to not give up and keep going. We'll hear stories about failures and how these leaders flip the script to create success. I'm John Schultz. Join me and let's discover how success is never really overnight. So welcome to the Upset Podcast, where we learn that most successes come from massive failure and how we pivot them to make failure our friend. And there is nobody better than today's guest, Randy Garn, at pivoting, creating, and making things happen. And we are so excited to have him on. And first, I'm going to uh, give a little preamble to, to Randy's life, you know, very small part, but I got to at least start out letting everyone know a little bit about you. So he's a New York Times bestselling author of Prosper, which is creating a life you really want. He's a contributing author to Entrepreneur Magazine, a partner in High Performance Institute with Brenda Bouchard, and an operating partner at Tamarack Capital. His favorite thing in the world is to help grow companies and people, which I love. That's uh, why we're a brother from another mother, I could tell already. Uh, He's a passionate teacher, trainer, and work with lots of CEOs, companies, and industry experts all over the globe. And he's a serial entrepreneur, founded at least five companies, and he's been Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year and Top 40 Under 40 Entrepreneur. And one of my favorite quotes from Randy is, surround yourself with great humans, which is why he's on this podcast right now, because he is a great human. So Randy, welcome to the upset podcast jonathan this is a pleasure man i can't believe that uh things are moving so fast this year but dude i'm i'm grateful anytime i can get on and teach and and help lift and build another another human that's that's what it's all about we we got we're we're fighting for milk every single one of us and every day so appreciate it uh my pleasure my pleasure all right so everybody buckle up because it's going to be a great ride and and i have a, a very interesting first question i'm always very excited to learn about people and you know not from where they are now but but how they started in life and you know what makes them them so the first question is you know some of your first ventures were really very interesting selling worms to local fishermen and taking out people's garbage for a dollar so like first of all how did you even think to do that and what you know what did you learn from that and you know give a little background yeah, I'll I'll hit I'll hit both of those real quick. Um, I my my whole life I think that I've always loved to create, and the other thing that I think my my father instilled instilled in me was two things: self reliance is the key to happiness, and number two, people are more important than things. And. When I was young, my dad was a high school football coach for 33 years. He's, he still is the most winning football coach in Idaho. We were with him, with him last night at a, at a fun private dinner with Rudy Rudiger from the movie Rudy. And growing up, we had a cattle ranch and we had horses and then he was a football coach. So he, he wanted to raise boys. And so being a high school football coach with six kids, you know, it's not the most financially, you know, best thing as far as like a monthly income coming in for you where our where most of our wealth was was wrapped up into the ranch and the cattle and all of that so out of necessity i didn't ever want to be a burden for my family and i and i saw you know i was the fifth of six kids so i was second to the youngest and i you know i i loved to create stuff i loved entrepreneurship you know i went out and i sold for when i was a boy scout went out and sold you know, different cards and things like that. I started my own lawn mowing business, but I think one of my f favorite ones of all time was we loved fly fishing. We loved to fish. And I was like, you know what? All of these grocery stores and all of these convenience stores needed worms. And so me and my little brother, we actually learned how to get chemical, go onto people's yards and you would literally fill up this huge <laughs> gallon that, I mean, it's like a 10 gallon bucket and you would dump it on the grass and then worms would just come up like crazy. So we would do that and you could actually sell worms by the pound. I didn't even know that was a thing. 
but that it was through asking questions and being like, dude, we, we got to go either find worms for ourselves. And then all of a sudden we got really good out of it. So we loved fishing. And then all of a sudden we started selling, selling uh, worms to all the local fishing shops around in Idaho. And from there, I was like, you know what, this is actually super fun. I was able to earn enough money that I wasn't a burden for my family. And besides that, it brought me great joy. We were like having, having a blast at 13, 14 years old, you know, selling, selling, uh, selling worms to fishermen. And then I think the other thing is just like innovation happens out of, you know, a lot of times out of necessity, but when you get really wicked smart, you understand that innovation and ideation is actually a process that you have to get really good at. If you're a leader, if you're a leader, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to understand how to innovate and ideate. If not, you will die. So, so from there, you know, I started a couple of other companies. We actually turned our, um, our, our property into a miniature golf course, me and my brother, we would charge people, you know, five bucks to golf. And then if they lost the ball, we'd charge them more money for that. So we were making more money on lost balls and other stuff than we were anything else. And you no, know, this is at 15, 16 years of age and, and, and a whole bunch of other things. And so, you know, I just, all my whole entire life, I've been an entrepreneur more so that the joy that came from creating and the joy that came from, uh, I can do it on my own. I don't need anybody else to take care of me. Like literally drop me off on an Island anywhere, Jonathan. Yeah. And don't take away my friends and don't take away my mind. And I will be take away everything that I have, all my assets, everything. If I have good friends and I have a wicked smart mind, dude, I will be able to create and drive enough revenue for my family. I feel that confident now in just the knowledge and friendships that I have to be able to do that. What I love is most people stop at the lemonade stand. They don't yeah. build middle miniature golf courses, right? So <laughs> but what's so great, I mean, you 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 had an entrepreneurial spirit yeah. from day one, right? So, you know, one of those spirits uh, you know, drives people to what they are and you 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 went above and beyond to do that, which is terrific. And by the way, Yellowstone is one of my favorite series now. I mean, oh, yeah. I didn't even know what a ranch was. What, like worms, I you know, I live in Jersey. I would run from worms. I wouldn't figure out a business <laughs> having to do with worms. So I guess where you grow up sort of gives you other ideas and ways to do things. So you've had a magic touch. You know, at least that's what I read about. That's how I know you. And, you know, when you read your bios and your interviews, obviously, you know, everyone would see Randy Garn as a major success, but most people never get to know the real story, which is, you know, not everything succeeds and not everything is the way it looks. And it takes a lot to get where we go. I always say my favorite phrase is being a 30 year overnight success, right? It takes a lot of years, time and energy to get there. So what was your most epic failure? And, you know, take a couple seconds to think about it. Cause I, you know, our audience loves hearing those stories, <laughs> man, that I've had so many, I've had so many epic failures. It's hard to, hard to pick one. Um, I'll share with you one that comes to mind. So, okay. you know, when we, um, so I'll, I'll go back a, a little bit about my history is you ask about the, the dollar, you know, taking out people's trash for a dollar and yeah. And when I was in college, I came back from, I lived in the Philippines for two years and I came back from that and found out again that I got a full ride scholarship to the college, but I still needed to earn some money. And I, I never, again, so I came up with a way that I was like, okay, hey, how am I gonna, I just land here. I get home December, like 23rd, I have Christmas and then I start college January 4th. And this is, you know, 96 and I'm like, I don't have anything in the, I don't, I've been gone for two years serving. I don't have anything in the bank. Like, what am I going to do? So I remember we went on a date and one of the girls was just like, Randy, you know, would you take out our trash? And I'm like, dude, my time is money. I'll do it for a dollar. And she said, <laughs> oh, heck yes. She's like, no, would you do that? You know? So I'm like thinking about this as a failure. I'm like, dude, I've got nothing. I got no gas in the tank. I got, I don't even have enough for a cheeseburger for a, a Big Mac. Anyways, she's like, yeah, if you'll do that. And then a roommate, she had four roommates. She said, dude, we'll all do that. Well, I'll give you a dollar. And they're like, can you come every Tuesday and Thursday? So I'm like, <laughs> do the math. I'm like, you know, that's eight bucks. And then I look around and the dorms, there were 600 dorm rooms. So out oh, of that, it's it. freezing cold in Idaho. It's like negative three degrees. 
none of these people want to take their garbage just across the parking lot and over to the dumpster. So that's all I had to do. So I got my dad's old truck. We loaded up that and I just went to every, every girl's dorm. And I said, Hey, all you got to do is put an envelope on the door, leave your trash out by the front. I'm going to be here Tuesday morning and Thursday mornings. Just have it ready. You know, we were, we were, me and three other guys were doing close to, you know, between four and 4,500, you know, dollars each a week just on wow. duty. And so like it paid for everything and they call this the buck buck guys. And from that, I met so many amazing people. I ended up meeting my wife from that. I ended up being the student body president of the college because everybody knew who we were, you know, and we just, it literally took like two hours every Tuesday and Thursday to make enough money for the three of us to not only like put stuff away. So I think about that, like you just think about that. If, and I could go do that today if I needed to. That's what I'm saying. Like the, the being able to solve problems for people and other people's failures and other people's struggles can actually be a way for you to just do massive, massive good in the world. And so if I think about one of my biggest learning lessons and biggest failures was, you know, and we actually don't, we actually don't share this with a lot of people, but we were exploding. Um, we started our first company when I was a junior in college. Again, it's just like, dude, I always want, I love human performance. That's why I'm partners with Brandon on High Performance Institute. We love lifting other people and building other people. So we have business models and trainings on how to be your very best self. When I was a junior in college, we put together a business program, a business plan, and we went on the entrepreneur program there and got, got we got $50,000 to help start our business. And we're like, okay. And then for the next 16 years, we didn't ever look back. And we're still doing that. We still have those relationships. And so from that time, I remember uh, about three years later, a guy came to us and said, hey, I want to take you guys public. And this is back, you know, when reverse mergers and, you know, all of that was really, really good. And we were supposed to get all these millions of dollars and, and, but we didn't understand what that fully meant. So the reason why I'm sharing this with you is we went public and it was the, it was the biggest mistake slash learning lesson slash like growth time ever. And so the first six months were awesome. We were supposed to get X amount of million dollars each in our bank accounts personally. We were supposed to do all this stuff. None of it ever happens. We're just like, dude, what's going on? So like we learned that don't ever, ever outsource your own brain and your own mind to what you can do. We didn't need them, but that was, it was supposed to be a good thing. We should have done way more vetting. We should have done a whole bunch of things. So it was like, we were sold a pig and a poke. It was a reverse merger. We're young, we're growing. And so our company is just growing like crazy. 100 employees, 400 employees, you know, 800 employees. And here we are with this, with these corporate raiders that are trying to take over. And I mean, I, so I built, a, I mean, we went public. We did a publicly traded company, but it took us a little over two years to eventually buy it back and to prove everything that was happening. And that was one of the things that I, I remember me and Ethan, you know, looking at each other and we're like, Dude, if we're waiting for all the smart people to show up, you know, they're not coming. And here we are, you know, 20, 25 years old, 24, 25 years old. We're running a publicly traded company. It, we have all this stuff. We have all these employees, 9-11 hits, anthrax hits. Like these are back in the, the days where things were just, it was, it was pretty interesting time. It reminds me of now. Yep. But I remember us having to buy our company back. All of our employees would be like, hey, we understand. And from that instance, we, I, we grew so much. They were supposed to be really good at lead generation. Never happened. We were supposed to get X amount of dollars for marketing. Never happened. We were supposed to do all this. So we ended up building that and getting those, those muscles, learning how to be the best marketers in the world, be, learning how to be the best lead generators in the world. At the same time, we're actually dealing with litigation and trying to, you know, help understand that whole circumstance and situation. So I got my JD MBA, and then we became very, very good at customer acquisition and lead gen to help our company grow. Cause that's why we did the merger was because they were supposed to be the best of that never happened. And you and I both know, if you don't know customer acquisition, your company is not going to survive. Right. So that helped us when it all came unraveled, we were able to set up a separate company that became the lead gen company. And that eventually grew that competency, those competencies that we learned made all the difference, not only then, but even today. 
you know, what's so interesting. So you thought you're getting something you didn't get it. Right. But if you look back now, which is why like looking at what failure creates to me is what makes us us yeah. like you had no choice, but to, I mean, you could have just thrown up your hands and oh, yeah. said, this doesn't work for me. Get me out of here, run away, hire a new CEO. You know, you were, you, you sold me a bill of goods, forget you, you know, all the defense flight and uh, fight or flight mechanisms could have kicked in and they didn't, yeah. but you became your best for the future by being forced into having to do what you had to do at that time. And th that, that's what I love, right? Cause you, you had two choices. Uh, and I think that's what failure brings and, you know, it's humbling, right? So it sounded like you got humble, you know, a humbling lesson during that time as well. Yeah. You know what? It's actually, it actually helped me grow a serious backbone as well. You know, it helped me, you know, learn how to trust, but verify. Cause I, I naturally am a very trusting per person. Cause I don't ever try to go out and take advantage of another, but there are people that do that. And those are hard learning lessons. The long, young, long, the younger you can learn that, the the more the better off you're going to be we should have had a board board of advisors at the growth where we were going i should have had a great board we didn't that public company was going to be the board and it, it ended up to be a nightmare and so i think from that what it what it taught me that failure taught me you know is one the cavalry's not coming you've got to learn how to take responsibility personal responsibility for yourself two jonathan the easier thing would have been is to just give up and me and my partner could have went and started another company. In fact, we talked about it, but we had 300 employees that depended on us and it would have hurt all of them because it wouldn't have survived without us. There's just, I mean, there's, it wouldn't have. So we consciously decided to continue that where we could have just said, okay, take it and run it. And, and, but we thought about all the families that were there. But I think the other thing is like, the, if you don't just think about yourself all the time and you learn how to serve before you sell, you learn how to take care of others. It taught me that because from that, even today, so many of those people that used to work for us are some of my best friends. And actually some of them are growing huge companies now and they witnessed and saw what we did. So from that failure, them seeing my character and seeing ours, how we didn't give up. We never gave up on it. We never gave up on our dream. We never gave up on the vision. It would have been way easier to do it at that time. But I think because of that, once it was all said and done, we just exploded with growth and won Entrepreneur of the Year and, and had just tremendous, tremendous success after that. But that was probably one of the most professionally growing times ever was through those dark days. And you know what? Like I'm learning about you as we're having this conversation. I love it. Sir, before you sell, and people are more important than things. You didn't leave those at the door. No. Like you, you, you the failure came. You know, again, fight or flight. What am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? You know, where's my character traits right now? And you live by them. And those sayings are amazing. You know, cliche sayings. Everyone does them, but not everyone lives them. And right. that story just proved you lived it. Right. And that's why people want to learn from you, listen to you, hear from you, hang around with you, including me. Uh, so I want to pivot here a little bit. Right. So we got failure. We talked about that. And we're going to talk more about that. But your book, Prosper, which you wrote in 2010. First of all, how hard is it to write a book? Let's just take a little sidestep here. I mean, it's grueling, right? It's like the most grinding process. Like, how'd you get through that, actually? Dude, I, I have so, I mean, <laughs> it is, I didn't realize the amount of brain power and, and that, that you have to really put forth to write a book and to manifest that, you know, we've helped tons of New York times, bestselling authors. I mean, we're, we're super good friends with, with a ton of them. You know, we did a lot of good things with like Ken Blanchard and, and I mean, seeing even some of the, the new things, but the reason why we wrote our book is because we were dealing with a whole bunch of thought leaders back, you know, in, in 2000 and that whole time from 99 to 2013, we were, you know, we were kind of BG before Google even on a lot of these things in lead gen. One of the guys said to us, said, Hey, you want to help me with my marketing and in my branding, and then also do all my education and training for my stuff. Why aren't you in a New York times bestseller, Randy? 
you know, why are you guys not New York Times Ooh. bestsellers? And they, they literally threw down the gauntlet. And I'm like, of course we can do this. Like, are you, are you kidding me? I'm actually kind of one of those guys that like, if somebody else can do it, I can do it. Right. You know? But, and, and he threw down the gauntlet and I said, hey, we'll, we'll have a New York Times bestseller by 2010. And, and we dug in and we did that. It was, it actually was a lot more time consuming than what I had anticipated. But now I know because of that, I know now what to go through um, to be able to do that. But it was, it was not easy. And, uh, and it's even, it's hard writing the book, but I'll tell you what the hardest part is, is getting the word out and marketing that. And a lot of people have some tremendous books, but they don't know how to get the word out. So again, that comes back to your network, your relationships, your ability to communicate. That's how you become a New York times bestseller. I like, and, and, and you just explained to everyone that's going to listen to this, that you got to practice what you preach. That person was right. Like, like how are you telling me what to do? I, you know, I don't see you doing what you're, you're telling me to do. Why aren't you there? Right. So, I, and, and again, like, I think all these great things come indirectly to you through your career that actually are all the challenges. Maybe we don't want to take on that are sort of forced upon us. Mm-hmm. And uh, what a great story. All right. So you wrote this grueling grinding book up all night nights and you know weeks at a time right but you got it done it, it was and, weekends it was nights it was yeah we had a little place up at sundance um and we'd, we'd go up there every wednesday and just pound it out and yeah, and framework it so yeah and it, it was a bestseller right yeah, i mean yeah. but now like all of a sudden it's 21 and you updated it like first of all why'd you do it and then what's the difference from prosper then to prosper now because think about it like as much as you thought you knew what the right direction was to educate, I'd love to, it, it, you're, you're, you know, I'm sure there's some stuff in there, not failures, but things that actually you learned aren't as good as what you thought they are, right? So, so what was the impetus to change it? Well, a lot of it was um, we, needed, we needed to update it. You know, it was, it was written, you know, 10 years ago. And, and it's a very similar time though. You know, we were just coming out of 2008, 2009. You were in real estate, right? Yep. You you remember October, 2008? It was like the the world fell apart. I mean, like the you fell off a cliff basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's very familiar to, and it's completely different circumstance, but emotionally, mentally, everything, a lot of people are dealing with other challenges. So nowadays, a lot of people, are wanting to know how they make an impact. And yeah. our book really is create the life you really want. And so really we did a ton of research. We went back and did a whole bunch. We've done over, you know, 80 plus thousand, you know, one-on-one coaching sessions on what matters most to people. We reached out to all of our, you know, other other database. But the thing that's interesting is the book was the balance. Prosperity is actually the balance between money, happiness, and sustainability. And so a lot of people right now are seeking happiness and joy and all that. But what is, why is that different than prosperity? Prosperity is actually being able to have enough financial, you know, money in the bank so that you can get rid of the stresses that you need, but also have a joyful life and do the things that you really love and make it sustainable over the long term, long term. A lot of people that I work with and that I know that are CEOs or whatever are doing very, very well financially, but their, their lives are miserable. You know, there's other people that I know that are super, super happy and joyful, but they are fighting emotionally being able to make ends meet during the day, their kids college and everything else. And that if you don't do what you love, it's not sustainable over long periods of time. You can't be excellent at it. And so we have a framework to help people find what's best for you. And that's really what the premises of the book is, is how do you come up with this multidimensional formula for prosperity, which is the balance between money, happiness, and sustainability? You know, it's so true. And what I love what you, happiness is fleeting, Mm -hmm. joyful is enduring. And I don't think many people know that distinguishing point, right? Mm -hmm. I can be happy seeing a picture of someone I haven't seen in a while, you know, but joyful means most of the day you have this feeling that you're in flow and that uh, you're just, you know, happy to be on the planet and to be alive. 
and uh, the sustainability is important. And, you know, I think it comes with hard work. And that's why, you know, if you become friends with failure during that, if you put it this way, if you like what you do, you'll be able to stay in what you're doing more and find the joyful moments easier than if you don't like what you do. Right. So I, I, I you know, people say it differently, but I think it's all, it's all a formula that's uh, so important. Well, uh, I, I think too, Jonathan, like you hit on a really key point is that part of having joy in your life is, is like really living in what we call being in the flow, which is pushing yourself where you've got to increase your skills with your challenges. So we actually also found that being, being joyful is actually failing and pushing yourself to certain limits and having that mindset of just be like, that's just part of the process. And I, and I, you know, a lot of people talk about fell fast. I always say fell fast, but win faster. And so you've got that part of that joy is the struggle. Like you, we choose our heart in our life. Like it's hard not to make money. It's hard to make money. It's hard to be an entrepreneur. It's hard not to. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually hard to get up and work out every single day, but it's also hard to get really sick and, and not be healthy. So I, I look at things, Jonathan, is everything is freaking hard and that's awesome. That's actually freaking epic and failing is awesome. And actually failing is what makes you tough and what makes you pivot. Learn that that's part of it. Don't get down. Don't get discouraged. Be like, that is just part of my freaking story. Listen, I think I'm going to take out my intro of the Upset Podcast and just actually cut that clip out. And you are going to be my intro. Because what you're saying is exactly what most people don't feel. I mean, when you just said joy is failing, that was just music to my ears. Because part of what it makes me feel good about what I've done in my career is getting out of those moments and then making something happen out of nothing or pivoting into something that makes it better uh, and not being afraid to change and not being afraid to fail because it's only a lesson learned, right? And you just, you just depicted that. So in that though, obviously, I think people also have to understand, you know, we hear all this like, be positive, affirmations, you know, and obviously, those are important, but you're such a positive guy. I mean, I, everyone's going to feel it when they listen to this. I mean, I'm feeling it right now and you're giving me energy, but what helps you stay there, keep upbeat. And like, how do you go about with that attitude facing challenges? Right? Because like everyone looks at Randy Gard as is almost too positive, right? Like, I mean, you have energy that most people don't have. But there's really what you go through when you have challenges that nobody realizes. So, so what do you, how do you explain that about yourself? You know, it's, it's a good point. And I, I would actually, I go through some dark, dark times even still. I mean, I, I, I want people to know that. And, but I do have a really amazing process for getting in the habit of being happy. And I'm just going to share with you some things that make an impact for me. So terrific. And going through failures, I have been through hell and back several times, you know, and guess what? Most of the joy and most of our sorrow come within our relationships, not within the business deal. Like most of our joys and more, most of our sorrows come within the, a, a lot of times with those key relationships. That's, that's really part of our humanity. One of the things that I try to do to stay very positive and happy is to increase my productivity. You know, high performing habits, we spent $13 million on research, Brendan did, on what are the six habits that help you be, you know, a high performer. And part of high performance means succeeding over the long term, above the norms, above the standards, while maintaining positive relationships. While maintaining positive relationships. So some of the habits that I've got myself into is this. I try to never ever miss working out in the morning and I enjoy alone time. Believe it or not, I'm a very, very, very social person. When I get out, like it actually does energize me to do events. Like, I mean, Jonathan, like you, I know we're going to hang out. I love, I mean, <laughs> we've got an event. No and, doubt. Yeah, yeah, we got, we got, we had an event last night with Rudy and, and we just, 
the energy was awesome and I love entertaining, but I do love to hike. I love to go fishing and I love to work out by myself. I love to go on runs by myself. And a lot of times I will think about myself, like whenever I get in a dark spot, whenever it starts getting hard, I will literally kind of reset and I'll either go, go take a 30 minute break. I'll go walk around. I'll go listen to some great music. I'll go put in a good podcast and I'll get, I'll check myself before I wreck myself. I'll get in a really good headspace. And a lot of times that is one of the things that I do. The other thing that I do daily is work out. And then if I start getting what I call stinking thinking or grumpy thoughts, is I'll, I'll literally go do something, you know, just get fresh air. I love the outdoors. I mean, if you you see right here, like I've got, I mean, there's the mountains wow. right there at, at my place. And it's it's important for me. I don't know, nature just grounds me so well. Yeah. But I think I'm going to share with you the third thing that has been a key for me is that I journal every single night. There's five immovable things that I have to do every day to keep getting better. And I check myself every night. Did I do those five things? And then the other thing is, as I always ask myself, how did I see the hand of God in my life today? And I will write down miracles that happened that day. And ever since I started doing that about three years ago, it has made such an impact on my life because I don't, I do feel like, you know, prayers get answered and people come into my life because I'm trying to connect with deity. I'm trying to connect with, you know, I believe that we're all, the other thing is like, I believe that we're all created for greatness and we just have to help each other find that. And then part of my part, I felt those five immovable. Then I asked, how did I see the hand of God in my life today? And then the last thing is like, who are three to five people that I need to reach out to and bless today? And that's what I, I mean, really, who are five people that I should reach out tomorrow? And so I've gotten a habit of actually trying to just give without anything, just give to give, do as much as you can for as many people as you can, as often as you can and expect nothing in return. And so I think a lot of my joy actually comes from giving, serving, you know, reaching out, seeing how can I help? How can I help you? That drives great happiness and joy for me. So those three things are my journaling practice that have made a massive impact in my life. You know, it's so cool. Cause like, what you're, this is so vulnerable and like people are going to get a lot out of this because everyone looks at people as if, how do I get there? How'd they climb that mountain? Mm -hmm. Most of it's just figuring out, figuring out our own stuff. Like, like how do we get through each thing that we're having challenges or struggles with in a way that keeps us grounded and keeps us feeling good. It, we, you, I love your journal. So I have a happenstance journal oh, because yeah. I think most things come indirectly by giving and doing and being and being excited about what you do. And every time something comes to me indirectly, I write it down and I look back every six months, three months, and those are usually my best things. And it wasn't things I was in complete control of it. Just by doing and giving and being and everything that you were saying, things came into my life too, uh, which is exciting. So I, I wanna end with uh, what's important to me, and I know you too, is family. Yeah. and you have this home court advantage. I hope that's trademarked because yeah. the way you use it to me is what a home court advantage really should always mean, not in a stadium, but mm -hmm. when you walk into your in and out of your doors of your house every day, so tell the audience what that means to you. I know you have, what do you, how many, you have six kids? How many kids do you have? You have, you yeah, have a I've big got, family. Got, I've got six rowdy kids. I've got, <laughs> the other thing is I, I do have, I've got two sets of twins. Oh my so, God. And That's incredible. Were you oh, a twin? No, I wasn't. <laughs> I mean, how'd that happen? Was your wife a twin? <laughs> My wife is just really effective and efficient. And she's like, <laughs> we're going to have six kids. We're going to wow. have four pregnancies and get it done. So two, two sets, that both fraternal. Or I, I, I love twins. So I'm asking you a lot of questions. Yeah. So fraternal, identical. They're fraternal. Okay. okay. Awesome. Good for you. They are fraternal and a ton of fun. Um, Family. I mean, again, part of our research and prosper and just part of the way that I live my life is that my, my wife is probably, she, I've made a commitment to her. Like she really is like my best friend and she's my favorite person. 
on the planet. And so, and not that again, everything's not always lollipop and gum, gum job, you know, but, but we've made a commitment to each other that we're going to have an amazing family, an amazing home life. Why I go to work and why I earn money and why I do what I do is for my family. Like that's, that's me. And, and I'm a dad, I'm a father, I'm an example, I'm a leader. And a lot of times people will just see how, if you, if you have a bad home life, it's, if it sucks at home, you cannot be as effective as you want to at work. I brought, you will not have the energy and the excitement of that. So no amount of success in the home can compensate for failure at the home. No amount, no amount of success in business can compensate for failure in the home. I, I'm nodding. I, I, cause I, I'm going to keep nodding cause I yeah. totally agree. Yeah. So some of the things that I do Saturdays and Sundays are all family. I shut things down Saturday. We have kid adventures. We have dad adventures. I take them fly fishing. We go sledding, you know, we'll go on, we'll go on an adventure, you know, over the holiday break, my, my twin girls, we're going to do something with their friends and go do some fun stuff. And so a lot of times it's, it's about being conscious about what you're doing there. And that the, the home court advantage for me is that when I get home, I want that's that is my safety and that's my special place. Well, what a way to end, right? Uh, I can't agree more. It, it, like it gives you such a sense of purpose. I'm like, and that, that it's the giving thing, right? Because who do you want to give more than to your family and your kids? So, so I, I, first of all, I want to thank you. This has been unbelievably awesome. I, I know you use the word awesomeness. Well, I've I'm I'm, I'm in awesomeness right now. So thank you. Uh, appreciate you spending the time, you know, for me having guests like you or why I do this. And I learn as much, uh, from the guests as I hope the audience will. I know you're Randy Garn on Instagram, your website, randygarn.com. Read more about Randy, watch some of his videos. Uh, every, you know, obviously this one, especially no, but, uh, definitely check Randy out prosper. You know, it, the new version came out. Please go and uh, buy that. I, I think it's not only great for you, it's a great gift to give out to your company and your, your clients, uh, especially now that it's an updated version. And, you know, Randy, thank you so much. And I, again, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Well, thanks, Jonathan, man. I love what you're doing. And let's just, uh, let's share more goodness out, out here in the world and, and help lift each other up, man. It's, it's the best thing to do. 100%. So thanks, everyone. And uh, see you on the next episode.